Hello, and welcome to the Beyond Six Seconds podcast. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel, and on today's episode, I'm speaking with Rakia Ware, also known as Ricky Z, a pre-K special education teacher who started her podcast management business in 2020. She's a co-host on Woe Nelly Media's Geekin' Out and is in partnership with ADHD in Black, an up-and-coming organization whose mission is to provide support and resources for the Black neurodivergent community. Ricky Z was diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 30 while in the process of coming to terms with untreated depression and anxiety. Ricky Z, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so happy to have you here today. So how did you discover that you have ADHD? It was very eye-opening. So like you mentioned, I am a special education teacher. So when I was 30, I was still working with K through five special education students. Interrelated is what they call it. So kids would be pulled out to my classroom or I'd go into their classroom. And a few years prior, I was dealing with the aftermath of some untreated depression, anxiety, an episode where like I started to get on medication for it. And then thinking about my students that I worked with, many of which were like third, fourth, fifth graders, a lot of them were boys, but looking over like their paperwork and like the evaluations that, the, that were given and like a lot of it came up with like executive dysfun dysfunction. I was like, okay, I'm looking at this definition and I'm seeing some of these, these symptoms, these traits. I'm like, I have that. Maybe that's how a, a little boy in elementary school might have them, but it it shows up. And then I talked to my psychiatrist, and there wasn't very much testing done for me, or maybe it was testing. And like my ADHD brain was like, eh, what is this? It was one of those computer tests, those computer assessments where you had to like click on the mouse whenever you saw something or heard a sound. And sitting there and thinking about it, I'm like, oh yeah, this is whatever. Apparently, I didn't do as well <laughs> I thought I did. <laughs> like, yeah, there's some signs of inattentiveness. Okay, cool. But I was officially diagnosed by my primary care physician shortly after turning 30. Mm -hmm. And it was very eye-opening because there were parts of my childhood where I could clearly see, like, yeah, that makes sense, thinking back about it now. But then... It became so clear after having children. So I think like having postpartum depression really like kicked it in high gear. Oh. Yeah. We mentioned in your bio that you initially had started the journey when you were getting treated for anxiety and depression. Was that around the birth of your children or was that sort of a lifelong thing that you were getting treated with? So it, it was shortly after having my second child. So I have two kids. One is 10. And my youngest is six. And so when my youngest was probably about three, I was dealing with a lot of the overwhelm of being a teacher and being a parent of two young children. And if you're a teacher, especially for special education teachers, like there's so much riding on like paperwork and data and like the legal aspect and, you know, dealing with higher ups that <laughs> it was very stressful to the point where like it I had an episode where I had to be treated and coming to terms with that and getting the diagnosis of depression and anxiety it made me realize that there were some other things underlying characteristics that I had that contributed to that and then just being a parent becoming a mother really exacerbated those traits for me mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd imagine it's the additional stress of, of caring for small people and this yes. big change in your life and your routines and everything. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's it's crazy because even now, like, my, my children are still elementary age kids and then, like, you're working with elementary age children and then taking, like, two of them home with you and it's like, it's never ending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Now that you realize that you have ADHD kind of looking back on your own childhood growing up. I guess, what was it like growing up as a Black girl with undiagnosed ADHD? Thinking back on it, there's many moments where I realize like the things that I do now for myself that people would consider positive traits were more like trauma responses <laughs> growing up. So 
the ability to be hyper independent. And I grew up in a, for the most part, a single parent household. And so that hyper independency, this kind of like, not necessarily feeling you can rely on the adults in your life to, to help you with, with certain things that you end up being like, oh, well, you know what, with a little bit of research, I can figure it out and do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And that's become a thing for me throughout my life. And it's been helpful. And then sometimes it's been harmful. Managing my time, school, I was always an okay student. It became harder in high school. Certain things that I enjoyed didn't really interest me as much as it should have to the point where like, I would struggle. College, I would do okay because of the newness of college when I was a freshman. But then when things start to pile up and bog down, like I would tend to crumble under the pressure and not do as well as I should have done. By the grace of God, I graduated. <laughs> But, you know, that that was something that, like, looking back on it, it made me think, like, yeah, this should make sense. And then as an adult, I struggle with managing my finances. I still do. Like, even with this knowledge of having ADHD, like, it, it makes sense for me now. But, like, having that knowledge, I'm like, oh, this is why I've always struggled with this. And, like, impulses and impulse buying. And forgetting that I have, like, this subscription to this thing that I had a free trial to like a year ago <laughs> and it's I'm still being charged for it. Yeah. It's interesting looking back, I guess, and seeing like I'm like, oh, that's how this all ties together. I I imagine right. it kind of helps make sense in some ways looking back of a lot of things in your life. It is. And when I was officially diagnosed where like it was not necessarily a load lifted off of me. It was more like a understanding that I'm not really lazy. <laughs> I'm actually can be very motivated in certain instances. It's just it it takes a different approach for me to get there. And it's not like how everyone expects it to be. And that's okay. And what's been great about it and also kind of hard is that it knowing this about myself and figuring out the things that work for me, it has influenced my my teaching how I interact with my students, how I work with my students, how I talk about my students with my colleagues that might necessarily not understand it. Um, and not just like being someone with ADHD, but like I have lots of students right now that have autism and just any type of neurodivergency, like understanding like there's a reason why they're having these struggles. Mm -hmm. And then it also makes me rethink my parenting as well. I see some traits in my oldest, my daughter, that I see in myself. And I have to really stop and think about how I respond to her and think, like, don't respond to her in a way that a typical parent, your parent, <laughs> another adult in your life has ever responded to you. You need to do something differently for her mm -hmm. because those same traits that you see in her are in you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you had mentioned before that a lot of the special education students that you teach, you said a lot of them are boys. So I kind of wonder if that's part of it too. I feel like boys, certainly when I was growing up and maybe even now, get flagged earlier or more often for their own, you know, either neurodivergencies or, or yes. other conditions than girls do. I don't know if, is that still the case these days? Yeah, it, it still is. I can tell you right now in my so I, so I teach, <laughs> so I teach, it's my eighth year teaching, a preschool special education class. I live in the state of Georgia. And so the state of Georgia has this program called Babies Can't Wait. If a child's been identified with certain delays before the age of three, they can receive interventions like speech, OT, mm -hmm. physical therapy. And then by the time they turn three, they can be evaluated in their school district through another program called Bright from the Start. Mm -hmm. And they can start school or start going to school or receive special education services as young as three years old. So even now, I I have seven students currently. It always grows. Right now, 
there's more boys than girls. There's always been more boys than girls when I've taught K through five. There's always been more boys than girls. It may be like one or two girls and then the rest of them are boys. Yeah. It's interesting because neurodivergence and, you know, learning disabilities and other conditions, I think are probably m much more evenly balanced across genders right. than, than we see. So, yeah. I think because when you think about how boys are, are treated in school, like it's usually like a behavior issue and yes, that affects them academically, but with girls it always seems it has to be even more extreme <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot of times for them to get noticed especially when like you're thinking like adhd and girls like the flighty maybe talkative or super daydreamy type of child mm -hmm. that's considered just a girl a woman girl trait but it could be something deeper than that and so a lot of times girls like myself get you know they go under the radar and like i said before like when i especially when i was younger like i was a pretty okay student so there was no real cause for concern as far as school but like everywhere else outside of life <laughs> there should have been some some clue mm -hmm. yeah exactly so knowing that you have adhd did it change the way that you treated or approached your depression and anxiety like was there any change in that once you had this realization Yes, all of the above. I had to really think about and understand that, like some of the things that would be considered like part of my depression. It's really like the executive dysfunction. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if I know that I'm not going anywhere and I'm really in a bad mood and I'd stay home, like taking care of myself tends to be harder. It's a lot of steps to go through to get up in the morning, especially when you don't have any motivation to get somewhere. So if I know it's not a work day, like the steps of getting up, taking a shower, getting dressed, brush your teeth, you know, all those things seem like a lot unless I have somewhere to be. And then with the anxiety, I've had to learn <laughs> that there are things that I can't take home with me, particularly as a, a teacher. If you're teachers now, they're talking about how like we work so much outside of our contract hours. And I had to make myself stop. Because, number one, even the idea of bringing my work computer home would stress me out because I knew that there was so much I needed to get done on my computer and I would dread it. And then I'd feel bad because I'd be too engrossed in trying to finish whatever the work was and then I wouldn't be able to finish it and then I'd be stressed throughout the school week. And at some point I was like, no, I, I can't. The fact that like these past couple of years I've been able to leave my computer at school, like on my desk, like shut it off, unplug it, leave it there as is. It's been so relaxing. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. been so like, it's taken a burden off my shoulders just to be like, I, I have to leave my computer at, at school. I cannot take this home because number one, it's going to sit in my backpack. And the fact that I know it's in my backpack waiting for me to work on it is, is too much for me. <laughs> yeah. Ha having that strong division between work and home. It took a lot, like, because making sure that like I don't stay at school two hours after my contracted time was hard to do because it'd be so easy just to stay there work on stuff I could put something on my smart board for my kids to watch while I'm working on something else on the other part of my screen but no I'm going to shut off my computer like at best 10 to 15 minutes after my contract hours I'll stay but no we're going we're leaving now we're going home we're going to spend time together. My kids have other things they got to do after school. Like, we're we're not staying here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, good, it's good to have that separation. <laughs> yeah. In, in some ways, even since, like, 2020, when a lot of us started working from home, I think we lost a lot of that separation. Oh, yeah. So that is a challenge to kind of bring that back and make sure you maintain it. Right. Well, and the balance between, like, not spending your time holed up on your computer while at home is has been a struggle lately. but. I think that like with with the business that I'm doing, it's easier to kind of just like spend some time on it and then step away, easily schedule some things to work on or post, and then go be a real person out in the real world. Mm -hmm. So you're a special education teacher and you also have your own podcast management business. Yes. I've been spending the summer like trying to find better ways to organize my time or create systems for myself that 
allow me to work efficiently and not have to work twice as hard to get like the same amount of work done. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just, you know, systemizing and, and automating and everything you can do to just try to conserve and preserve your time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you to start your podcast management business? Ooh, this was, this was a bit of a journey in like a short amount of time though, but it was a really great mm -hmm. journey. I started off my business, so Ricky Z Social Media, wanting to be a social media manager. It went from wanting to be a virtual assistant to focusing on social media. And then a college friend of mine, the founder of Wonelli Media, he had started his digital media business probably about not too far away from me starting mine. And he had a podcast. It was a video podcast. And he had asked me to be a guest on one episode with some other people. And so from there, like we did the episode and we were like, this is super fun. And this is where we got the show that I co-host now, Geeking Out. And so we would do that like every week. And I would help him with little things like creating graphics for the episode, creating audiograms and video highlights of each episode, and then like helping with production. And we use StreamYard to broadcast the live stream. And so like I would help with the backstage stuff. And I, oh, and I love, love that stuff. And I love learning about that stuff. And so it went from me focusing on social media, which, you know, I still do the social media part, but leaching even further into podcasting. And so from there, I was like, this is this is where I'm at right now. This is what I like doing. I love doing the production, the editing, the content, repurposing, all that stuff. Oh, and that's great. And when you started doing podcasting production with your friend, was that your first venture into podcasting? Yes, actually, yeah. Oh, no. And it was, it was such a good time. It was just, it went from me just kind of being a guest to being a co-host to practically being like in a production manager. And now like we, I still have my separate business, but I work with him a lot with other projects. So we still have geeking out going on. I started working on another project for Wonelli Media called Scream Kings, where one of our co-hosts were geeking out and his friends talk about horror and film and TV and things like that. And it's been really great to just like pre-record some shows and get to start editing and start creating more things. So like, and that should be premiering in October. So it's been fun to like just be a producer. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, all the behind the scenes. And there's so much that goes into putting yes. together a podcast. I think if you're not a podcaster, you may not realize it, but there's a lot of things that go into it. And I think that also kind of like satisfied the the dopamine chasing <laughs> that I have because mm -hmm. there's so much to learn. My coworkers at the school that I work at, they call me the tech guru. Mm -hmm. I'm not really a techie person. I just, when literally left to my own devices, I learn and play around with stuff. And so like, I just happen to know a few things here and there that help people out. So like, being able to learn about editing and production and podcasting in general, it's been a great entertaining, but also like it's ever growing. The industry is still growing. There's so much to learn. So like I'm, I'm kind of in my element. <laughs> yeah. I feel like, especially with my own podcast, it's like, all right, I always have something interesting to do. It's like, okay, there's like 20 different things I could do. Pick like yes. the one right now that is the most interesting right. and do that. Yes, I, the, the amount of like little courses that I take and like little groups that I join and like I've learned so much along the way and like I'm still learning and so it keeps it fresh for me. I think that that really helps with with the ADHD. Like there's so much that still is fresh and still for me to learn in the process. Yeah, and you also have, you know, as we mentioned in your bio, you have a partnership around putting together some podcasting, video programming around neurodiversity itself. So yeah, tell me about your partnership with ADHD in Black and the show that you work on with them. Awesome. Yes. Oh, ADHD in Black is an organization that was founded by a friend that I met via Facebook and another podcasting group. Her name's Tara Jean Noir. She's out in Texas. So hey, Tara. She had made a post on Facebook asking if someone with ADHD is interested in podcasting, can help her out and get her started. 
And what started from just that simple Facebook page, it like expanded to this whole friendship <laughs> that we were working this organization. So ADHD and Black was going to be this podcast. She started talking about her journey, similar to mine, being, you know, diagnosed with ADHD as a Black woman later in life. And we were just kind of, kind of getting her ready and getting her prepped for all that stuff. And then I was thinking of something similar, but hers was going to be more of an audio podcast and I was going to do video. We decided to kind of combine our efforts to create Black Girls Hyperfocus, which we started doing a little bit during the summer. We have about six or seven episodes right now. And it was really fun to get started on. So we did a lot of the graphics and promoting and topics in hand. And, you know, it messed up with a lot of things with ADHD, like things kind of like like pitter out for a little bit because you just kind of feel like you're overwhelming. There's so much you can, there's so many like options that she could do to make things work that I think it was a bit overwhelming <laughs> for the both of us. So we got like five or six episodes in and then we are on a pause right now. But what we did for that little while was great because it helped me better understand some of my own like issues with neurodiversity, particularly being a Black woman. But the main part of ADHD and Black was mainly focusing on restorative justice for black neurodivergent because being neurodivergent and black does affect your life socially and how the world perceives you and with that in mind when we're thinking about things like police brutality and and things like that like the consequences the effects of being a person of color and neurodivergent can be almost fatal and it's really hard when you don't have the resources to help combat that and like we mentioned earlier a lot of the times when we were thinking of people with disabilities particularly with ADHD like we're thinking of the research that's mostly about young white males so that's already the spectrum of that and then you have to consider like when we think of like black children that are being diagnosed particularly black boys like they're considered aggressive and troublemakers the school to prison pipeline things like that and so when you consider what that means for someone who's made it through school and is an adult now it's really stressful and hard when you don't have the resources to help you out so that was the point of ADHD and Black was to for us to start curating more more resources for Black neurodivergence. Right, that's great. There's so much intersectionality with yes. identities and neurodiversity, certainly with race and with gender and even with age, because, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, grew up without realizing that they had certain conditions or they were misdiagnosed. The thing with Black boys being perceived more aggressive, I've heard that they tend to get more like an oppositional defiant disorder diagnosis yes. when it's really ADHD or autism or something else. Yeah. And I have like, and that's been like really conflicting as a special education teacher mm -hmm. where like you have that knowledge in the back of your mind about how a lot of black boys are misdiagnosed or just, like they're quickly defined as oppositional defiant. Mm -hmm. And then that, that label <laughs> goes with them throughout their school. Like think of how many children that are like, diagnosed or labeled with emotional behavior disturbances and it's really more more complex than that absolutely yeah so it's great that you're starting to create and curate these resources for for people to learn more about that because there needs to be a lot more resources out there than there are now absolutely. there's a lot more resources there needs to be a lot more research done there's so much more that hasn't been done there's some steps taken it's particularly like when you look at the research for women in general, you know, because ADHD and a lot of women doesn't look like what it looks like for little white males, for young white males. So think about what that means for a young black female or even someone in their 30s and they're realizing, oh, wait, I've been, I've been coping <laughs> mm -hmm. for the majority of my life. This is why this is the way it is for me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's great that you're creating that. And, and hopefully there is going to be more research on, you know, more than just the young white boys that we've been focusing on with ADHD and autism and, and pretty much yes. almost everything. And 
the medical model. So what kind of response have you received from people who have listened to your shows? So with Geeking Out, of course, it's very niche But with ADHD and Black, I feel like we're tapping into something that a lot of people have not realized yet. Because, you know, this whole idea of it's being diagnosed later in life. And I kind of, like, take it back to, like, how people say, when they look at, like, TikTok, how a lot of people realize that they were neurodivergent by watching TikTok and Reels. And it's like, yeah, there's there's a reason for that. And so we're kind of tapping into that, to that area, but also with that niche of like, we're looking at how it affects Black neurodivergence and how society kind of prevents us from getting those resources and that treatment that's needed, or it just doesn't really like match up to how we are culturally. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the TikTok algorithm is better at diagnostics than like some of the research that's been it, done it's, it's crazy to think about it's like even now like it's becoming more of a search engine than than google is sometimes yeah no really there's a, a lot of people as you said realizing that they're neurodivergent on tiktok and other social media and and building communities there as well i think yes. that's another thing with social media is that you know, almost everyone I talked to who's late diagnosed kind of felt like they were the only person who was going through this or who, you know, responded this way. And then you meet like all these people who have like very, in some ways, very similar stories. So I think social media helps kind of bring everyone together, at least make everyone aware of each other. Yeah. And, and that was also part of the mission, is part of the mission of ADHD, but is building that community to make sure that people feel like they're not alone. They're not the only ones. And there are people out there to help them, to help support them, give them guidance, resources. Like, they're not alone. That's the most important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you've already mentioned a few things here, but what are your goals overall for your shows and your neurodiversity advocacy in general? My goal, number one, is to support other neurodivergents, particularly people of color, even more so women, Black women in, in general, understanding that they are not alone, that there are others there to support them. I'm into sharing other stories. I want to be the one to back up the storyteller. That's part of the reason why I, I love doing what I do with podcasting, doing all the stuff in the background. I'll do all the stuff that, that you don't find interesting at all because I love it. And you can focus on telling your story and sharing your life with others. Right, that's awesome. Yeah, and those roles are so important because, yeah, very different skill sets. So it's just a great complementary skill and and really going to help a lot of people make it easier for them to share their stories and connect. Right. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, well, Ricky Z, thank you so much for being on my show today. How can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about the type of work that you do? Oh, my goodness. So... You can find me on Instagram at Ricky Z. That's R I C K E Y Z social. Um, also on TikTok as Ricky Z, R I C K E Y Z underscore, as well as on Twitch, R I C K E Y Z underscore, Ricky Z. Okay, perfect. I'll put links in the show notes so people can find it there too. Thank you. And yeah, as we close out, is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to know or anything that they can help or support you with? Oh, goodness. Be kind to your teachers out there, y'all. So I know we talked about podcasting, but like as a, as a teacher, we're all in there for the same reasons. We all want what's best for our children um, and also our children with disabilities. Just, you know, be kind to our teachers. We want to be kind to y'all. And we're we're all working towards the same goal. Absolutely. Yeah. Rick Easy, you're doing great work one as a special education teacher and <laughs> as a podcast manager. I appreciate that. Helping people so much. So that's great. Yeah. Thank you again for being on my show today. Thank you.